Praise God. Please turn with me to Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11. And this is part 13 of our series on Daniel. And we have seen that this series is truly called The Heavens Rule. The Heavens Do Rule. Daniel chapter 4, 26. We're going to finish this Bible study next Wednesday night with Daniel chapter 12. But here tonight, the second part of Daniel chapter 11. We dealt with the first part of Daniel 11 last week, but we're going to continue with it tonight. And my message tonight, listen very carefully to what this title is. And we are going to look at and give it its meaning here tonight in this message. The Assyrian Antichrist. The Assyrian Antichrist. And this is part 13 of our series. And we're going to read from Daniel chapter 11, starting in verse 36. Daniel chapter 11, verse 36, read in the last 10 verses of Daniel 11. And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. For that that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces, and a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many, and shall divide the land for gain. And at that time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, with chariots and with horsemen, and with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries, and shall overflow and pass over. He shall enter into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon. And he shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver and over the precious things of Egypt. And the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and shall utterly make, ta- make away many. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his place between the seas of the glorious and holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. Will you pray with me tonight as we come to this Bible study? Father, we thank you for these Bible studies, Father, that have set our mind and heart aright to see that the heavens do rule in an hour where everything is breaking loose, in an hour where an entire world is changing, where we are about to see some of the most radical changes in world history, when we are at the very edge, at the very door of so much Bible prophecy coming to fulfillment. Father, we cry out tonight as we realize that we are on the edge of some of the worst days in history, some of the most wicked days in history, some of the most evil days in history, where more blood shall be shed than in any other period in world history. Father, we cry out tonight for revival. Use this message tonight to make us to cry out for the 8 billion souls in our world. There's only a short window of opportunity left and you have said while it is yet day that we are to labor my god will you stir us to pray to labor to evangelize nor god don't let us rest at ease in sand don't let us be asleep in the church 
while the world is on its way to hell. Lord God, use this message to warn us of what this generation is about to face. Lord God, the billions of people on this earth, and Lord God, make us a missionary church again. Lord God, send us revival again. Lord God, bring in a great harvest of souls. And Father, I do pray that you open our eyes, Lord God, to see what the word of God says tonight. In Jesus' name, make this church a vessel, an instrument, and a new cruise, Lord God, to fulfill your divine purpose in this hour. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Part 13, the Assyrian Antichrist. I have described in this message the Antichrist. I've given him a certain name and title and description, the Assyrian and you're going to see in this message why I do that tonight. When we come to Daniel chapter 11, many Bible teachers, many authors, many expositors of scripture either put much of this chapter in the past and say that it was fulfilled in the past, or there are others that take much of it and put it in the future. There are those that do not see Antiochus that we dealt with here. They don't see him in this chapter. And so they say from verse 21 through to the end of the chapter, verse 45, that it's all in the future and it's all about Antichrist. But then there are others who don't see Antichrist here. All they see is Antiochus. And so they take from verse 21 through to verse 45 and they put it in the past. They say it's been totally fulfilled in history, and that there's no further unfulfilled prophecy in it. Well, I come right down the middle, like on so many other things, and I disagree with both and agree with both. I, I do believe that Antiochus is seen in verse 21 through uh, on, until, um, on, until that portion is fulfilled. But since there is more in this chapter, and we're going to deal with it tonight as we look at the Assyrian Antichrist. I believe Daniel chapter 11 begins to show us more about who the Antichrist is. It begins to reveal certain things about him. And you know what? If we don't know what the Bible teaches, if we're not clear in our understanding, we will get caught up in false teachings, ideas, and theories about Antichrist. While I've been teaching this Bible study on Daniel, I've had a man, an author, pursuing me, asking for an interview, who has written a book that Prince Charles is the Antichrist. That's where you end up going if you do not know what the Bible says. Let me take you immediately into this message tonight. Point one, the shadow of Antichrist. I believe that here in Daniel chapter 9, we see the shadow of Antichrist. What is a shadow? A shadow is a reflection from the substance of the real thing. In other words, that thing that is real, that thing that is true, when the light shines upon it, it casts a long shadow. Now, when we think about Antichrist, we know he is future. He'll come at the end of time. But when the word of God shines upon him and begins to reveal him, his shadow is very long. In fact, the shadow of Antichrist shines upon him and it goes all the way back to Genesis. His shadow doesn't go forward in time. His shadow goes back in time all through the Old Testament, through the book of Daniel and reaching unto Genesis. If you look closely through New Testament eyes, you're going to find the Antichrist in the Old Testament. When we come to Daniel chapter 11, we see from verse 1 through to verse 35, the shadow of Antichrist. In other words, up to 30, verse 35, we actually have information that is in history, in the past, that it goes back into the Old Testament that is already come and gone, but it is a shadow for us that actually reveals something about Antichrist. We've already said in Daniel chapter 11 that it covers a period of time of three 
165 years, that in 35 short verses, as we dealt with last week, there were 135 predictions about four details per verse. That's what we find in the first 35 verses up to the end of the life of Antiochus. And I believe within those 35 verses that you find the shadow of Antichrist in a man called Antiochus. Read with me in verse 21 as we look at the shadow of Antichrist. And in his estate shall stand up a vile person to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. From verse 21 through to verse 32, you have Antiochus Epiphanes. You have that eighth Syrian king who is a shadow of the Antichrist. What do I mean a shadow? I believe his life depicts what the Antichrist is going to be. He is a type of the Antichrist. When you look at his words, his actions, his name, his geography, the things that he done, you actually begin to see that he is a type of Antichrist. And that's what we see in the book of Daniel. Also, when we looked at Daniel chapter 8, we also seen him there, this man called Antiochus, the eighth king of Syria, the kingdom of the north, also called the king of the north. We began to see the shadow of Antichrist in Daniel 11. He was not the Antichrist. He was not the man of sin. But what he was, was a shadow or a type. When you begin to look at his life, there are, is such a resemblance. There's a similarity to the real, to the substance, and to that which is going to come in the last days. He attacked Egypt, and after attacking Egypt, he then invaded Israel. When he invaded Israel, he stopped the daily sacrifice, set up the abomination of desolation, in the holy place in the temple. That initiated a great persecution where he killed about 100,000 Jews. He implemented one religion in his kingdom and dominion, and he tried to corrupt the entire nation of Israel, stamping out every other religion. He wanted to secularize the entire people of God, and he literally... Um. He literally and he completely fulfilled all that was spoken about him in Daniel chapter 8 and again in Daniel chapter 11. It is a remarkable prophecy concerning Antiochus, this king of the north, this Syrian king, this eighth king. He was a shadow or a type of Antichrist. But do you know what? He was a whole lot more than that. Now, those prophecies about him say that he was going to reign. There's going to be a period of six years and four months, not seven years, not three and a half years. That is for Antichrist that's going to come in the end. But this Antiochus was going to be there for a period of time. There is exact prophecies concerning him. But he certainly was not the Antichrist. Some say that these prophecies were about Antichrist and not Antiochus, but that is utterly impossible. It is a different man. The prophecies were fulfilled. He was the shadow of the Antichrist. He come up out of the Grecian Empire prior to the Roman Empire, the fourth beast taken control. And we know that there is another Antichrist to come, but he was more than a shadow and a type. Listen here on this first point. Antiochus in Daniel 8 and in Daniel 11 was more than a shadow. He was more than just a picture with a resemblance. He was actually an antitype. Up to verse 35 here, we have far more than just a shadow far more than prophecy fulfilled in the past. There's certain things concerning the prophecy about Antiochus that are strange. I actually believe he was also an antitype or a prototype, or he prefigured the Antichrist. 
There are certain things written in Daniel 8 and Daniel 11, which it's hard to believe have been completely fulfilled. So when we look at Antioch, August, we actually find that there was only an initial fulfillment and that there's still a further, fuller and complete fulfillment that is gonna come in the career of the Antichrist. So when we look at Antiochus, we see a picture of the abomination of desolation, his persecution of Israel, his war in the nations. In all of that, we see that there's more things involved in him that were prophesied that are yet to be fulfilled. Let me give an example in chapter eight and verse 10. It says, and it, the little horn, wax great even to the host of heaven and cast down some of the host of the stars to the ground and stamped them. Now that was prophesied about Antiochus, the little horn that come out of the Grecian empire. And yet how do we fit that into the life of Antiochus as just a man? It seems there's more that he is an anti-type. In other words, there's certain things there that only the antichrist can fulfill. No other man in world history is going to fulfill. He is a prototype. He is a plan. In fact, there is such a similarity. It is unnerving. You see, the Bible doesn't point us to a Hitler or a Mussolini. He points us to Antiochus as a type and a shadow of Antichrist. If you hold the two of them up, it's more than a shadow, more than a type more than a similarity. It's like Antiochus, God molded him to be a prototype. Yes, small. Yes, in, in, in fashion, only a beginning, but there's more to him. He is an anti-type. He has been molded in a certain image. In Daniel 8 and 23, it says, and in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. Here talks about the little horn of this man when transgression comes to its full. I believe again, this points to the Antichrist. So we see that Antiochus in his life, in the days of the Maccabees, when they read Daniel, they said, this is him. He set up the abomination of desolation. When they read Daniel, they could identify him and say, this is the little horn. This is the one that's come and put in the abomination there. They had understanding of the scriptures. They knew how to act. It was an indication to run for their life because persecution was going to begin. Antiochus, was the last and the worst tyrant and persecutor of Israel in the Old Testament. But Antichrist, as we know him, will be the last persecutor of the church age. We are going to see that there's a great resemblance between Antiochus in the Old Testament and between Antichrist in the New Testament. There is a prophecy in Antichrist's life that is, sorry, in Antiochus's life, that is remarkable, absolutely remarkable. In the year 1932, Edith and Ralph Norton, American missionaries who had gone through D.L. Moody's Bible School, were in Italy as missionaries. They were Bible preaching, fundamentalist Bible Christians. And I'm a fundamentalist. Every true born again Christian is a fundamentalist Christian. You are a fundamentalist, a Bible believer, a literal believer in scripture. Well, they were in Italy in 1932. They studied Daniel. They knew their Bibles. And as they seen Mussolini arise, they were very fascinated in what was happening in the nations. They actually got an interview with them, a talk, and they record there that they went to him and began to warn him about Daniel, the little horn, and what was going to happen in the last days. They thought it would be a warning to him of tyranny and of raising up Italy as a nation again and of ruling over other nations. As they sat and began to explain him to Mussolini, Mussolini showed great interest and he said, does it really say that in the Bible? Does it really say that? And he began to inquire. 
Then he began to ask them where it says it. And then he sat back and began to smugly smile. Do you know this man, Mussolini, when he heard about the little horn, he desired to be that little horn. He actually desired, he longed to imitate such a man that he could be the fulfillment of that prophecy. Since there is a wickedness that one day is going to come to this world, worse than Mussolini, worse than Hitler, worse than Antiochus, and he is going to be raised up. But we have a shadow in our Bible. Daniel 11 gives us a shadow. That's my first point here. There's a shadow of Antichrist in Daniel 11 that's already been fulfilled. But second of all, the rise of the real Antichrist, the rise of the real Antichrist, verse 36, and the king shall do according to his will. And he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every God. After having dealt with Antiochus from verse 21 through to verse 35 and the days of Antiochus, suddenly we come to verse 36 without announcement, without explanation, without commentary. We suddenly move to a different king, a different era and a different time. And I'm gonna prove it to you here that we suddenly move to the Antichrist and the rise of Antichrist. Having finished deal, having dealt with Antiochus, verse 36 speaks about another king who's going to arise in the very last day. In verse 36, at the end of verse 36, it says he shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. For that that is determined shall be done. Now notice what it says about him. It calls him the king that shall do according to his will. He is a willful king. He will be a dictator. He will be a tyrant. It was Lord Acton who said a very fascinating thing, and everybody misquotes it, almost everybody. Lord Acton said, power tends to corrupt. He didn't say power corrupts. He said power tends to corrupt. And absolute power corrupts absolutely. Men like Mussolini were corrupted by power. Hitler, Antiochus, and there is a common king in our world that power is going to go to his head like no other man. Power will absolutely corrupt him. Now look at this willful king here. It says back further back in verse 3, the exact same thing about Alexander the Great. In verse 3, it's a prophecy about Alexander. And a mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. What Alexander done with his will, he ruled, he was in charge, he made his decision, he triumphed over the world. So the Antichrist, no one is going to tell him what to do. He will challenge everything. He will rise up by the power of his own will to be the greatest tyrant in world history, to conquer nations, to implement his own will. Notice that this rise of Antichrist, that it is his will, he is determined to impose his will upon an entire generation. The ancient Jews in Israel used to believe that this verse, this scripture concerning this king in verse 36 was the common Antichrist. That's how they interpreted this king. They said this is a king that would come in the last of the last days. Look at verse 36. It speaks about the king. But go back to verse 35 and the sentence before this. Look what it says. Even to the time of the end, because it is for a time appointed. In this chapter, when it talks about Antiochus, it finishes with this. Even to the time of the end. The persecution that the Jews were going to go through, the troubles, the harassment of the Jews, the suffering of the Jews was going to continue 
until the time of the end or the last days. Why is that? Because it is yet for a time appointed. Certain things are going to happen to Israel as a nation, but there is a time appointed. In other words, a fixed time, a certain season that Israel is going to continue suffering until. In verse 35, we see that it leads directly to the last days with the history of the rise and the reign of Antichrist, who is also called the King of the North. The last five verses of this chapter are all about the deeds and the actions of the last king of the north. He is going to be a king who comes on the, on the scene. He's going to rise up in this region, in this time, at a certain, a certain set time, and he's going to fulfill all of these things. It actually says in chapter 12 and verse 1, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, it's still speaking about what we're dealing with at the end of chapter 11. It's talking about that time, a very specific time. What time? When this king is going to arise, there is coming a king on the earth, who's going to suddenly begin to arise by the power of his own will. And it is going to be such a remarkable time. It's going to be like no other era in world history. In chapter 10 of verse 14, it says, Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days. You see, Daniel chapter 10 began with the last vision of Daniel. Chapter 10, chapter 11, chapter 12 is the last vision of Daniel. As we go through last week's study and next week's study, as well as tonight, we are looking at one complete vision. What is it all about? What is the message of what we dealt with last week, tonight, and what we'll deal with next week? Will Daniel actually was told by the angel that I have come to make you understand what is going to befall your people, Israel, and the city of Jerusalem in the latter days. For yet the vision is for many days. Do you realize this last vision? And we, as we have looked at the kings of Syria and the kings of Egypt, an Antiochus, and now we come to the real Antichrist, a person, a king, who's going to ra- rise up in the last days. Do you know what all of this is concerning? The angel was telling Daniel what is going to happen to the Jewish people and to Israel as a nation in the very last days. In other words, chapter 11, all of its details are written to show you what's going to happen at the end. That's why I said it's a shadow. That's why I said much of it is a type. It is to bring you to this point, to the very last days that I believe are just ahead of us. And I believe this generation is going to see the rise of this man. In fact, I would dare say he is on the earth today. I believe Satan has his hand upon him and is preparing him right now for this day and generation. He is going to be a vessel prepared of the devil to come against Israel in the very last days. And that's what all of this is about. In chapter 11, verse 27, and it says, And both of these kings, speaking about one of the earlier Syrian kings that sat at a table with Uh, Ptolemy. And this Syrian king, this king of the north, was Antiochus. Now notice what it says about him. Antiochus, the king of Syria, sitting at a table, a peace table, a table where they're going to make an agreement. And they both sit at that table. And it says, both these king's hearts shall do mischief, and they shall speak lies at one table, but it shall not prosper. Look at them. These two kings are making a peace deal, yet they're both planning to betray the peace deal and to attack the other. It happened in history. 
but it's going to happen again in the future. As they sat at that table, they're both making plans. But what did Daniel prophesy hundreds of years before this? It said, it shall not prosper, for yet the end shall be at the time appointed. In other words, these two corrupt, wicked kings of Egypt and Syria, their plan and betrayal, they have hidden secret things in their heart. But God is watching over it, saying, not yet. Not yet. God is in control. And in fact, these evil men, God is organizing their plan. He knows exactly what they're doing. You see, Mussolini thought he was having his way. Oh, no, God had a plan on it. Hitler thought he was having his way. An antichrist will believe he is having his way. I assure you, God is going to bring forth his purpose in all of the earth. In verse 36, it calls him the king. It just simply announces him, the king, one who we have heard about before, no explanation. It's taken it for granted that, you know, this king who suddenly comes in at the end of the story of Antiochus, of the prophecy concerning Antiochus, that there is another king like him. He's not a shadow anymore. He is the substance. He is the full fulfillment. He is going to be the embodiment of Satan himself. They announce the king here. There is a progressive revelation concerning Antichrist from chapter 7 through to chapter 11. We are getting more and more of the story, seeing who Antichrist is, what he will do, where he will arise, and what his nature and character will be. Since we are being taught here, and because men and women don't study this, because the church of our generation does not teach this, they say we don't need to worry about Antichrist, we don't need to teach it, we're not looking for Antichrist, we're looking for Jesus. Amen, I agree. I'm looking for Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus, Maranatha, I am consumed with the Lord Jesus Christ, but we must preach and teach what the Holy Spirit has revealed. It is a warning to this entire generation. There is a revealing of who this Antichrist is. And you'll never understand 2 Thessalonians 2 until you understand this. That's where so much wrong teaching comes from. They jump into Revelation without having studied Daniel. They don't understand Daniel 11, yet they think they're going to understand Daniel 13. That's not possible. There is a revealing, a teaching of the Holy Spirit. You see, we see this king announced in verse 36. He has been spoken about before. He's been spoken about in Daniel chapter 7. He was called the little horn. He's spoken about in Daniel 9. He was called the prince that shall come and sign a seven-year peace agreement with Israel and then break that agreement and set up the abomination of desolation. We, we see all of these things previously. This is the king. But I want you to notice this, that he comes at the end of a long line of kings. Why is it that all through this chapter 11, we have primarily focused in on the king of the north? We have seen six kings of the north mentioned. Antiochus was the eighth king of the north, just like Antichrist is going to be the eighth head that we read of in, in the book of Revelation. So we see all of this coming together, that Antiochus was the king of the north. He was the king of Syria. And so we see Antichrist coming at the end of this. In verse 40, some try to create a battle between three kings. They say there's the king of the north, the king of the south, and then the willful king. And they try to say that in verse 40, and we're going to come to it shortly, they try to create three kings here, the king of the north, south, and the willful king, who is the Antichrist. They make them different ones, but that is not possible. It's talking about two kings here. The willful king is the king of the north, and he is the Syrian king. And we're going to see it before long. So we see the shadow of Antichrist. 
Then we see the substance, the rise of the real Antichrist prophesied in Daniel 11. The angel revealed to Daniel concerning the rise of the Antichrist, who was going to come right at the end of time. And he was going to do certain things and say certain things. And he was going to look a certain way. Since we ought to know what the Bible says, and we won't fall for the false teaching. Third of all, the religion of Antichrist, not only the rise of Antichrist, but the religion of Antichrist. It's very important that you learn this here tonight. There are five distinct things that it says here that the religion of Antichrist will not be. In other words, it strikes out or disqualifies five things concerning his religion. And then it gives you four comments concerning explaining what his religion is going to be. You see, some people say he will be a professing Jew. Others say he will claim to be a Muslim. And still others say he will be an apostate Christian. And then there's those who will say he'll just be an atheist. I want to tell you, here in Daniel 11, we have a very thorough, in fact, as thorough as anywhere in the entire Bible, describing the religion of Antichrist. If you understand what he says within these two verses, you're going to dismiss an awful lot of teaching about who the Antichrist is going to be and what his religion is. Let me point out five things that it says here that his religion is not. And it's talking about five gods and five descriptions of gods, which he is not going to worship. Follow with me in verse 36. The first thing is, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god. Notice here that when this king comes, when the real Antichrist comes, the substance of Antichrist, the first thing that he's going to do is magnify himself above Every single God in the world. In other words, every world religion. You see, there's those that think Catholicism is going to be the last religion of the world. Others say it's going to be Islam. Others say it's going to be New Ageism. Well, we have a description. When the Antichrist comes, he will exalt himself, raise himself up above every other single God and above every other religion. In other words, his religion is marked by self-promotion. He is going to be exalted above every God, above Jesus, above Muhammad, above the Jewish Messiah. He is going to exalt himself above every single God that has ever, ever been mentioned. He is at the heart of his own religion. He puts himself at the center as the as the very vessel of worship, all religion, all names of every God are going to have to submit to him. He makes himself higher and greater than any other single God. This ties in with 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and it speaks about Antichrist, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God in the temple of God showeth himself to be that he is God. So look at him. He is not coming promoting one of the great world religions. He's not coming promoting one of the gods that is popular in our world today. No, not at all. He exalts himself above every God, every religious system. That's only the first of five things it says. The second thing in verse 36, and shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods. This is the second thing, defining about his religion. This is the religion of the Antichrist. Notice here, it's a reference to the true God of heaven. He is going to speak against the God of gods. Who is the God of gods? It is the God of the heaven. In Daniel, in the book of Daniel, in the books of the Old Testament, this term, the God of gods, in Daniel 2, in Deuteronomy 10, Joshua 22, 
And in Psalm 136, this is used for the God of heaven. It is one of the most notable things about the Antichrist that he will speak against the true God. We see this in Daniel 7 and again in Revelation 13 and here in Daniel chapter 11. He is going to speak against the true God. He's not imitating the true God. He's not selling himself as the true God. He is actually exalting himself against every God. And he speaks his main focus of attack, of blasphemy, of accusation is going to be against the true God of heaven. When the real Antichrist comes, he's not selling himself as an imitation. He speaks against the God of the Old Testament, the God of the Jews, the God of the Christians, the God of the New Testament, and the God of the Bible. While he magnifies and exalts himself over every God, it is only the true God that he attacks in this manner. He will speak marvelous things against him. This means that he will go to great lengths in creating arguments, in creating accusations to destroy belief in the real God of heaven. All of his talk is going to be an attack against the God of heaven. He exalts himself above every God that is mentioned. And he, it says that he's going to do this and he, he shall prosper. He's going to prosper in it. You see, some Christians and sinners, they think, well, if God allows certain things to happen, why is that? Surely God doesn't allow things to happen. God is going to allow him for three and a half years to blaspheme, to curse God, and yet no lightning is going to strike him down. Three and a half years. I'm sure he's going to say things like this. I curse you, God. If you're real, strike me down. Nothing happens. You see, I believe he'll so blaspheme and he will prosper. God will not judge him. God will not stop him because there is a time appointed for judgment. And it says, for that that is determined shall be done. In other words, all that's in Bible prophecy for three and a half years, God will let this false religion to prosper, to go unchallenged. It'll seem like he exalts himself and he gets his way and many in the nations worship him. This is obviously, this obviously leads to the setting up of the abomination of desolation. His blasphemy against the real God leads him to set up an idol, a statue, an image in the very holy of holies in the temple in Jerusalem. And that temple is going to be rebuilt again. You see, the Bible shows us the significance of all these things. Thirdly, in verse 37, neither shall he regard the God of his fathers. Now notice, he is striking off here a list of things. So he's got, he's named all of the gods of the nations. Then he names the true God. Then he comes to a third area. It says, and that this will be different than the God of the Bible. Each of these statements are to explain something unique. This statement that he will not regard the God of his fathers is in contrast to the previous statement. The God of his fathers, the God of his ancestors is different than the true God of the Bible. I don't believe he's going to be a Jew or a Christian. He's going, his actual fathers are going to have worshipped a different God than the Jewish God or the Christian God. I believe this is a third God, the God of his fathers, the actual religion of his parents or of his nation or culture, he will not regard it. I believe Antichrist is going to come out of a religious culture. The culture he arises amongst are going to be a religious people with a uh, worship and either God or gods that are going to be worshipped, but he will not regard the God of his fathers. He's going to utterly disregard him. The God of his fathers is different and distinct from the God of gods. Now, listen, if he is a Middle Eastern Arab from Syria or Iraq or one of those Middle Eastern nations, if he comes from a Muslim family, he will not 
disregard the God of his parents. So we have more and more spoken of here concerning the religion that's going to come. And since I have to preach this and lay it out, because so many teach he will be a counterfeit Jewish Messiah, or he's going to be an Islamic antichrist, or he's going to be something else. So I'm just teaching you and showing you what the Bible says. The Bible says it for a reason. He's not going to regard the God of his fathers. He's not going to consider him, acknowledge him, or promote the God of his own people, of his own nationality. The fourth thing in verse 37, nor the desire of women. Now, from this statement, some people have said that the Antichrist could be a homosexual. They think when it says about Antichrist that he'll have no desire, that nor the desire of women. He will not respect or regard the desire of women. They interpret that to mean he won't love women or have a desire for them. But it's not talking about his desire for women. It is talking about him regarding the desire that women have. He will not regard that. That's a very different statement. Now, those who think it's talking about his sexuality, that he's a homosexual, it cannot be. There are five statements given here concerning his religion. This statement about the desire of women is concerning the religion of Antichrist. It is saying that he will not regard the desire of women. This desire of women has something to do with a particular kind of religion or a worship or a God or goddess, and he will not regard that. He will reject that. Do you know what I believe it, it is talking about here? Isn't just ancient goddess worship. It's talking about something more about our generation. I believe it's talking about the feminism that is spread across our world in this generation. Please note here this statement concerning the desire of women mentioned concerning Antichrist. In the Garden of Eden, a serpent allured Eve with the desire for enlightenment, wisdom, equality with God, and likeness to God. He lied to the woman, and he said, Do you know what? If you take of the fruit of the tree, your eyes are going to open, you'll become like God, you will know what God knows. So here is a form of religion, a likeness, an inner illumination. I believe this is what this verse is talking about. The Antichrist is going to reject this feministic, enlightened religion of this generation. The first mention of the desire of a woman in the Bible is in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. Listen, we are told, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also to her husband with her and he did eat. Now here is this religion, I believe, that sweeping our world in this generation. The wisdom she was desired was to be as a God and to desire that. But there's also something else here, that there was a punishment upon her by God concerning her sin. Listen to what God said to Eve, thy desire, dealing with the desire of a woman, thy desire shall be to thy husband and he shall rule over thee. Your desire, you know what that word desire, we've dealt with this before. The desire of a woman is to manipulate, to control, to want to be the head, to want to lead the home, to want to lead the man, to want to direct the man. That is the desire of a woman. And I know that um, not every woman is dominated by that, but there is an urge do you know what I believe this is? Is what's dominating our world and it's invaded the church. There, there is a feministic spirit that's religious, that's dominating and manipulative and wants to rule the home and rule the church. I assure you, Antichrist will not stand for it. You, 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 you think we're so bad if we don't tolerate such things in the church that the man ought to be the head of the home 
and we teach this openly, not abuse. No man of God is ever going to abuse his wife. He'll treat her like a queen. He'll honor her. But I assure you, Antichrist will not tolerate the feminism and the so-called equality of this hour. He'll utterly disregard it and wash his hands of it. He will exalt himself. He will be worshipped. That man, that Antichrist, will subject every woman under his rule. Do you hear me tonight? Do you see how the world is being tricked and fooled and played with by Satan himself? When he gets in control, he is going to abuse women like no other man ever has in any generation. Christ will never abuse a woman. He honors her. But Antichrist is going to abuse the femininity of women. The fifth point here, nor regard any God. <clears throat> Not only will he exalt and magnum himself above all gods, he will also not regard or consider or tolerate or promote any other God. It's not going to be a merger of all religions. It's not going to be Catholicism. It's not going to be Islam. It's not going to be feminism or New Age worship. He will not tolerate any God, any worship, any religion. Then he gives four explanations of his religion. Verse 38. But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces. The God of forces means the God of fortresses or the power bases, strong fortresses of ammunition. So he tells you, I disregard all gods. But then it says, but in his estate shall he honor the God of forces. You know what? He's going to worship war itself. He is going to make a god. It's not going to be a god of war from ancient history. Oh, no. He is literally going to have a type of religion. He is going to worship. He is going to magnify force, the power of the sword, of ammunition, of weapons. And he is going to honor this in the world. The God of force, only war is going to be magnified in that hour. Then in verse two, it also says, or sorry, verse 38, it also says, a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and with pleasant things. A God, a God who his fathers knew not, he is going to honor. In contrast with the worship of the God of his fathers, it's going to be contrasted. If his fathers were Muslim, he is going to worship differently. Do you know what he's going to do for his God, his God of war? These bases, these power places of weapons, of strongholds, of forcing the nations into bloodshed and to cause them to be subdued. Do you know what he's going to do? He's going to honor his God in a way his fathers never worshiped their God. What does he do with his God? He honors the God of war, the God of fortresses with gold and silver and precious stones and pleasant things. In other words, he's going to offer all of these things. It's going to be idolatrous, but his fathers never done that. When they worshiped, they didn't offer up gold and silver and things like this. So it's going to be in contrast. Also in verse three, thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory. He will actually present these goods and offerings to this God in the very strongest of fortresses. This God will be honored in a variety of places, but those places will be fortified places. They are going to be places of religion. In other words, war, ammunition, weapons is going to be forged into a type of religion. All of this is going to merge together and he's going to honor this God. This God is called a strange God or a foreign God. It's not known in this generation. You see, I believe the religion that's coming is going to be like no religion on the face of the earth today. I don't believe you can identify today. I believe he is going to magnify himself, make himself God. And out of this warring spirit, create something that's going to bring bloodshed 
to this generation in a remarkable way. I'm telling you what's facing this generation. This is the man that this generation is going to worship. This is the one they're going to follow because of his signs and his wonders. But this is where it is going to lead to. This seems to mean that he will be a new, there will be a new form of worship that is foreign to anything that exists at this present time. The fourth thing he says in verse 39, and he shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain. Those who promote this religion, protect it, and establish this worship that he promotes will be given positions of power. What does it say? To rule over many. Those who follow this religion, he's going to lift them up with great power and influence. He's going to divide up lands and nations and give them influence in this generation. That's the religion. We saw the rise of Antichrist, the religion of Antichrist. Now, number four, the region of the Antichrist. I believe we find all of this in Daniel chapter 11. His shadow, his rise his religion, and now the region of the Antichrist. I believe one of the main reasons we have Daniel 11 is to show us the region of the Antichrist, his nationality, the geography of where he arises. This is one of the important things. You see, when you look at Daniel 7, you see the political system where he arises. It's going to be the fourth beast, the revived fourth beast. It's going to be in the last days that he's going to arise as a little horn amidst 10 horns. That's Daniel 7. It shows he's going to arise in that Roman political system. But here in Daniel 11, we have all the information to show where he is going to rise. You see, I don't believe he's going to rise in North America. I don't believe he's going to rise in the EU or Western Europe. I don't believe he's going to rise in Australia or in England or in Ireland. I don't believe, I believe it's utterly impossible for that. He won't be English. He won't be American. He won't be German. I actually believe that Daniel 11 is given to show us the nationality or the region, area, and nation where Antichrist is going to arise. You see, all of this is to teach us, to show us, to identify beyond any shadow of a doubt who he is. If we knew this, it would cut out all the false ideas, saying, I think it's Kissinger. Well, he's dead and gone now. Then they pick Obama. Well, Obama's not in position anymore. Tomorrow, they'll choose someone else. But if you know this, you're not going to pick the president of France or of Greece or of some other nation. You're going to be very careful. Look at verse 40. It talks about the king of the north. This isn't a prophecy of the past. It's not talking about the ancient Syrian kingdom of the Seleucids. Here you have in verse 40 is a prophecy about Antichrist in the last days, just before the end. And what is he called? The king of the north. Well, you and I know there are no kings of the north at this time. There's no one with that title at this time. And you know what the Antichrist called the king of the north? You can't make it something different than has been all through chapter 11. What the king of the north is all through chapter 11. And what Antiochus was as the king of the north. So again, in the last days, Antichrist is going to be called the king of the north. Do you remember in chapter 11, we traced the kings of Egypt, of the south. They were called the kings of the south, the Ptolemies. Then we traced the kings of the north. They were called the king of the north individually. They were the kings of Syria. And we've seen how they both interacted and Israel was caught between them. Now we jump to the last days to a prophecy and we read of the king of the north again. Do you know what I believe? The Antichrist, when he arises, is going to be called the king of the north. I believe he's going to be the king of Syria. 
what the ancient Syrian empire was, will be revived and he is going to come forth out of it. He is going to be the king of the north. He's going to be a king. He's going to be a ruler. He's going to be a political military leader. Remember what Daniel 7 says. It calls him the little horn. There's going to be the 10 great world leaders who join together for a world government. He's going to be a little horn. Insignificant. Small compared to them. He's going to rise up as a king. He is a political leader. In Daniel 7, sorry, Daniel 9, he is called the prince who is going to come to make a political peace deal. And so we see that he is a ruler of a nation, a king of a nation. But which nation? How are we going to decide? How are we going to know? Is it going to be a European nation? Is it going to be a Western nation? I believe Daniel 11 shows us it's impossible to be these other areas. You see, ancient Syria, don't think today. We know that there's war going on in Syria. Syria as a nation is destroyed. Over the last decade, the last 10 years, Syria has been destroyed. Entire cities have been brought to ruins. The population has been scattered. Syria today is in ruins. What is ancient Syria? It isn't present day Syria. Listen, what is the ancient kingdom of Syria? It was two present day nations joined. This is what they are, Iraq and present day Syria. Do you know today both nations are lying in ruins? Both nations are in ruins. The world powers are talking about rebuilding both of these countries. They need to rebuild Iraq and they need to rebuild Syria. Both nations have been destroyed over the past 30 years, utterly destroyed. They need to be rebuilt from the ground up. Their cities, their roads, their culture, everything about them, politically, economically. Do you know what I believe? I believe that Syria, ancient Syria, is going to be revived again. Let me tell you something. I was shocked when I found this out. And I began to look at Iraq and Syria. They are neighbors. They share a border of more than 300 miles. They also share a common history. Since the 1920s, both nations have dreamed of reuniting these two countries to become one nation. Since the 1920s, for 100 years, they have tried to make plans. They have tried to accomplish it at certain times. In 1978, they signed the Baghdad Accord, which was an agreement that they would unify Syria and Iraq. They would join their military, their economics, their politics, and their cultural traditions and become one nation. That was 1978. But the following year in 1979, Saddam Hussein rose up in Iraq. And he stopped this because he wanted to maintain power. And he stopped the agreement coming about. And he deposed the powers and started a conflict that lasted through until he was killed in the year 2006. It's only just over a year ago that for the first time, Syria and Iraq have again opened up their border post and began to trade once more. Both nations are in ruins, but I believe that there's going to come a reviving of the ancient Syrian empire. You see, if what I'm saying is true, Antichrist is going to be killed the king of the north. He has to be the king of Syria of Syria and present day Iraq, there is going to come about something politically. Listen for, further, and I'm not going to go too far into this. The Bible calls the Antichrist the Assyrian, not only the Syrian. I believe Syria is going to be revived and there's going to be a king of the north again that's going to come into conflict with Egypt in the last days. But I believe that king who's going to lead who's going to be the last king of the north, the last Syrian king. His name is going to be the Assyrian. You say, where do you find that? I find it in many places in the Bible. I find it in Isaiah chapter 10, verse 12, also verse 24 to verse 27. 
We don't have time to look at all these. I find it in Isaiah chapter 13 and Isaiah chapter 14. I find it in Isaiah 30 and chapter 31. I find it in Micah chapter 5. If you begin to study this, you find out there's going to be a man called the Syrian, who is also called the king of Babylon, who is also seen as the last king to lead an attack on Israel before the last days. In all of these chapters, you begin to read about it. Do you know that if you trace back the history of Syria, it goes back to Assyria. It's the same region. And if you trace back Assyria, you go back to Nimrod, who founded um, four cities in the land of Asher, which is North Iraq. In other words, the Assyrian comes from the north of Iraq. The Assyrians are northern Iraqis. In the south is Babylon. You've got all of this here. And in the ancient kingdom of Syria, you also have Nineveh in the north. All these cities that ancient Nimrod established, they're all going to be in the ancient Assyrian, Syrian kingdom that's going to revive. I believe that this king of the north is going to also be called the king of Babylon. And I, if we had time, I could take you to Isaiah chapter 13 and 14 and show you that Babylon is going to be destroyed in the last days. It'll be the headquarters of the Antichrist, as we see in the book of Revelation in chapter 18. That is the destruction of the city of Babylon. In Isaiah 13 and in chapter 14, listen carefully on this point. In verse 4, we read about the king of Babylon. Verse 12, Lucifer. And verse 25, the Syrian. The king of Babylon is the same as the Assyrian and is identified with Lucifer himself. I believe Daniel 11 is showing us the region, the geography, the area, the nation, the culture, the people where Antichrist is going to arise. He's going to arise in an Arabic nation. It's going to be a restored, rebuilt nation. I believe Babylon as a city is going to be rebuilt. And that certain events are going to happen in the last days. And that a new religion is going to arise. A new culture, a new nation, a whole new political system. All of this is going to arise. And I'm sure you'll admit it's no surprise if this happens. Point five, the wars of Antichrist. We have exact details concerning this last king of the north. Look at verse 40 with me. And it says, and at the time of the end, notice when it happens, at the time of the end, shall the king of the south push at him. Who is the king of the south? The king of Egypt. Saints, I'm just about to tell you where the bloodshed starts, where the wars start under the hand of Antichrist. When he first appears, he'll come as a man of peace. He'll come signing peace deals. He'll want peace in the Middle East. He'll be a great ambassador of the Syrian nation, of the northern kingdom above Israel. He'll be there wanting peace. But look what happens to initiate the bloodshed of the last days. And at that time of the end, shall the king of the south push at him. In other words, Egypt is going to begin pushing against Syria. Here is the last war between the north and the south. And Israel is going to get caught in the middle. And the king of the north shall come against them like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships. He's going to have a fleet of ships. In other words, Egypt is going to start the conflict. It's going to come against the northern kingdom of Syria. And when that happens, this king of the north, this Assyrian, is going to come like a whirlwind against Egypt. He's going to attack Egypt. He's going to invade Egypt. He, do you remember what Antiochus done before he attacked Israel? What did he do? He invaded Egypt. After invading Egypt, what did he do next? He invaded Israel. Israel got caught in between. Antichrist is going to do the exact same. Then in verse 40, it says, and he shall enter into the countries, not just Egypt, into other countries. When he invades, his, when he invades Egypt, attacks Egypt, he's going to begin to invade other nations as well. And he shall overflow 
and Passover. Again, in verse 41, it says, many countries shall be, overflow, uh, be overthrown. And again, in verse 42, it mentions countries. Three times it mentions many countries that Antichrist is going to invade and take over. But notice verse 41, after Egypt, verse 41, he shall enter also into the glorious land. The glorious land is Israel. And it says, and many countries shall be overthrown. Do you see he's doing what Antiochus done? He actually attacks Israel. He attacks Egypt. He enters into Israel. And you know, he's going to set up the abomination of desolation. He is the little horn. He will go into the temple. He'll do what Antiochus done. It's all here. It's all going to be fulfilled. Look who's going to escape from Antichrist. Some of you have asked me, my wife has asked me, do you think any of these nations will be able to function outside of the power of Antichrist? Yes. Here's an example. Verse 41. But these shall escape out of his hand. Edom, Moab, and the chief children of Ammon. Who are they? All three nations, Edom, Moab, and Ammon are east of the Jordan River, outside of Israel, right next to Israel, but the other side of, of the Jordan River. What nation is this? This is present day Jordan. All three of these mentioned peoples are now in present day Jordan. Do you realize Antichrist will, will not be able to take Jordan? Jordan somehow is going to escape from Antichrist. He will not be able to invade or capture the small nation of Jordan. Then look at verse 42. He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries. I believe that means many countries. And the land of Egypt shall not escape. Jordan will escape. Egypt will not escape. But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver and over all the precious things of Egypt. He is going to get rich out of Egypt. I believe in the last days, Egypt is going to rise. And these days, maybe they'll strike oil. Somehow, we're going to watch Egypt suddenly become very rich. It's going to be one of the great rich nations of the world. One of the great military nations of the world. It's going to be a great power. The king of the south, he's an Egyptian leader who is yet to come. But Antichrist is going to get rich out of Egypt. He's going to take all of their wealth and become very rich. Notice who else is with Antichrist. It says in verse 43, and the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. They'll walk and step with Antichrist or the king of the north. They'll be in unison with them. The Libyans are North Africans. The Ethiopians are the Sudanese. These two small nations are going to walk absolutely in step. Let me finish here this Bible tonight. My sixth and final point, the doom of Antichrist, the final judgment and doom of Antichrist. You see, if this was a prophecy about Antiochus, then it's not fulfilled. Antiochus didn't die in Israel, which Antichrist is going to do. Antiochus died far to the east, far away from Israel. He died of depression, madness, of a broken heart. He wasn't killed in battle. Antiochus died because he couldn't conquer Israel finally. But do you know what? The Antichrist, we're going to see his final doom here in verse 44. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore, he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. He's going to take away many. Here he is in war, triumphant, victorious, besieging the little nation of Israel, having invaded. But news is going to come, tidings. He is going to hear things from the east and the north that are going to so alarm him that he's going to turn and come with rage. It has to be armies. You know, when we go to the book of Revelation, out of the east, the Euphrates is going to dry up and a mighty army is going to come out of the east. I believe this is it. Antichrist is going to hear of this 
Asian army, this Chinese army crossing the Euphrates, and he's going to be alarmed by it and turn with anger against those soldiers. I, it also says news out of the north. We read in the book of Revelation that, that one of the judgments under the sixth file and the sixth uh, trumpet is going to be that Babylon the Great, that great city is going to fall. This is the capital of Antichrist. I believe in the sixth seal at the end of the tribulation, as it comes in, the judgment is going to befall the city of Babylon. All of this is going to be happening as all the armies of the world get pulled into the Middle East for the final judgment that's going to fall upon them. In verse 45, concerning this Antichrist, and he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountains. Between the seas, what is that? The Mediterranean Sea and the Dead Sea. He's going to plant his palace or his tabernacle or his war tents or his base of operation. This is going to become his new base of operations for the Battle of Armageddon. It says that um, in, in the glorious and holy mountain, yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. I believe this is the end of Antichrist. Where is he? He's in the land of Israel, in the region of Jerusalem. In Armageddon, north of the city of Jerusalem, you are going to see the end of Antichrist. Saints, I'm telling you that this is the future history of our world. The rise of Antichrist, the religion of Antichrist. We have seen the religion that is going to begin to spread out across the world. What's going to happen? We've seen the region of Antichrist, where he's going to arise. We've seen the war of Antichrist. We've seen the doom of Antichrist. Since it is a remarkable hour that is ahead, and we are taught about the Antichrist. Don't enter into foolish speculations. This is the darkest, most evil hour in world history. It's only going to last for three and a half years. The great tribulation where Satan is going to turn on Israel and turn on the nations of the world and plunge the nations of the world into bloodshed. What, what a horrific hour. Ought we not to pray for revival for the Middle East? Should we not be praying, laboring, looking for one last revival that before wrath and judgment and terror engulf the nations of the world, that we, the church, the last church, of the last generation, of the last hour of time? Should we not be like never before seeking the Lord? Don't you realize Ireland's going to be a part of that bloodbath? Don't you realize the world is going to be soaked in blood? And only those that know Christ are ready for this? Saints, I want to tell you, the darkest hour is ahead, but the most glorious hour. There is coming a great victory. Let me finish my study. There's so much more we can deal with. But saints, we ought to know what the word of God says, lest we fall into wrong teachings and suppositions about the last days. We need a walk with God in this hour. And I believe the stage is being set. Isn't it amazing that we can watch Syria and Iraq and see what begins to happen in these days? We, we can watch world government and the nations and the economy. And what's happening with technology? All of it is convergent. This is the hour. If ever you're going to serve God, you better do it now. If ever you're going to live for God, you better do it now. But let me, I don't want to leave you with Antichrist. And I don't want to leave you with just hearing about Israel and Syria. The king of the north and the king of Egypt all in war together. What is finally going to happen to Egypt? Syria or Assyria and Israel. Can I close this Bible study with one beautiful promise about the coming reign of Jesus Christ on the earth, a prophecy that's never been fulfilled. Listen carefully in the light of all I've said, I've left you with a horrendous vision of the days of Antichrist. But now let me show you a beautiful vision of what Christ is going to do when he comes to heal the nations when he's going to beat all the weapons of war into plowshares, 
when he's going to take all the swords and bring to naught the weapons of war and bring in everlasting righteousness. Listen, this beautiful promise and prophecy in Isaiah chapter 19, verse 22. And it says, and the Lord shall smite Egypt. He shall smite and heal it. And they shall return even to the Lord and shall be entreated of them and shall heal them. Notice what's happening. It's a prophecy about not only the wounding of Egypt. It's going to be wounded, but it's going to be healed and restored. Listen to what happens at the time that Egypt as a nation is going to be restored by God, healed as an entire nation, restored unto God. Listen the time. Verse 23. And in that day shall there be a highway out of Egypt to Assyria, from the south to the north, from Egypt to Assyria. And the Assyrian shall come into Egypt, and the Egyptians into Assyria. And the Egyptians shall serve with the Assyrians. And in that day shall Israel be the third with Egypt and with Assyria. Isn't this glorious? In the light of all we've taught here concerning Antichrist, see what happens when Antichrist is in the Middle East between Assyria and Egypt and Israel. But look what happens when the Messiah comes. What happens between Israel and Egypt and Syria? They're going to be joined together. Even a blessing in the midst of the land, whom the Lord of hosts shall bless, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, and Syria, the work of my hands, and Israel, mine inheritance. Do you realize there is an hour where God is going to heal the nations? He's going to heal England. He's going to heal Ireland. He's going to heal Germany. He's going to heal America. He'll heal Australia. He'll heal Lithuania. He'll heal all of our nations. Saints of God, it is real. There is an hour where one called the Lord Jesus Christ is going to heal the nations and restore them. And there's going to be a highway of holiness. Can you imagine a highway of holiness from Ireland over into England? And the English shall come over into Ireland and the Irish shall go over into England and we will serve God together and the nations of the world will be united in holiness before the Lord and everlasting righteousness will cover the earth. Saints, I tell you, the knowledge of the Lord is one day very soon, and I can see the fulfillment of prophecy coming. I can see that we are at the end of time, that all the tragic prophecies are coming to pass, but all the glorious prophecies are coming to pass. And our cry ought to be, Maranatha, Come, Lord Jesus, aren't you tired of this old world of ours? Aren't you longing for Jesus to come and to catch us up in the clouds of heaven? Aren't you looking for him coming? Aren't you preparing yourself? Aren't you making yourself ready to go home to meet the Lord Jesus Christ? There is coming a day when we're going to see the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, I pray tonight that we won't be left with a vision of antichrist his shadow and substance but we're going to be left with a day an hour where you're going to heal all of the nations of the world you're going to bless them you're going to restore them you're going to unite them as individual unique nations that are saved and redeemed out of the world nor god i thank you that you're going to bring peace and righteousness and truth that you will be exalted at the end of this that you are going to be glorified after man has done his worst after antichrist has left destruction you are going to heal the nations and reign upon the earth for 1,000 years. We love you, Lord Jesus. We are no fools for worshiping you and serving you and following you. Father, I pray that in this church, we get a taste of heaven and earth, that we catch a glimpse of these things. As we see what the nations are doing, we're not going to be perturbed. We're not going to be in fear, but we're going to be praying for the kingdom of God to come on the earth. Lord Jesus, it's you that we desire in this last hour. Amen. God bless you.